the story. But we had to build these incredible contraptions in order to do it. George was our general. We're his soldiers, and we're all fighting this single battle to get this film out. We're going on the front lines here. And uh, that gave us also kind of a feeling of being special and fighting this great battle to you know, get this thing done, whatever it is. To help inspire the effects team at ILM, Lucas had spliced together aerial dogfights from old war movies. That would be like the first animatic, which you do all in the computer now, of course. And we matched frame to frame and the action on that as close as we could. And it was hugely helpful. I got him! Great kid! Don't get cocky! To describe that abstract world of a, a battle is impossible. Storyboards don't do it as far as the pacing, the rhythms that he needed. That was a great thing. As fall turned to winter, Star Wars finally started to take shape. That's it, we did it! We did it! <laughs> Working from the raw production tracks, sound designer Ben Burt would add a critical new layer to the film. <laughs> Bert had spent a year building a catalog of sounds for things that didn't exist in our galaxy. George introduced the idea of what he called an organic soundtrack. George thought that Chewbacca might be a, made up from a recordings of dogs or maybe even bears. In addition, I recorded some lions and tigers and even some walruses. I would begin editing them together and making little phrases out of the noises. I would take the recordings and edit the best pieces. You know, the bear might make a sound that sounded angry. Or they might make a sound that was cute. Or a sound that sounded like a sentence, a wah, wah, wah kind of a sound. Well, you said it, Chewy. The voice of R2 turned out to be the most difficult problem to solve in the sound design of the first movie. Because R2 had to act alongside of the other actors. And the script uh, only said that R2 made a sound or maybe R2 beeped. I had a small electronic synthesizer and I did some patches with it and made up some electronic sounds. But that didn't sound alive. At, at one point, we talked about uh, R2's personality, and we felt that he was developing kind of as a, as a toddler. So I did a lot of baby recordings. And eventually, we found that we, in the discussion of R2's voice, we were making the sounds ourselves. A few experiments led to the combination of using my voice doing baby talk beeps and boops with the electronic synthesizer. So R2 is sort of 50% machine and 50% organic coming out of, you know, the performance of a person. The breathing for Vader was recorded by putting a little tiny microphone down inside a regulator on a scuba tank. And I breathed through the, the mask itself and it breathed in and out, and out of that came the, the various, you know, paces of Vader breathing. And that sound worked out pretty successfully. Finding the right voice for Darth Vader was another challenge. And action! Lucas had never intended to use the on-set vocal performance of David Prowse. Start tearing this ship apart piece by piece until you found those tapes. Find the passengers of this vessel. I want them alive! I can still hear David Prowse's accent in the Darth Vader mask muffled, because he would do the real dialogue. He's trying to curse Carrie Fisher or something. Thank you. Now, what you're talking about, I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic You mission. are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away. It was hilarious and terrifying at the same time, because we didn't know what Darth sounded like. That was the first time we heard him. We are like, is that it? Is it going to be some Scottish guy, or what is this? Prowse's voice would later be replaced with a more menacing performance, provided by classically trained stage and film actor James Earl Jones. George had hired David Prowse, but he said he wanted a so-called 
darker voice, and not, not in terms of ethnic, but in terms of um, timbre. And the rumor is that he thought of Orson Welles, uh, and then probably thought that Orson might be too recognizable. So what he ends up is picking a, a voice that was born in Mississippi, raised in Michigan, and was a stutterer. And uh, that happened to be my voice. I want to know what happened to the plans they sent you. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away. C-3PO's voice struck us all as, you know, well, we got to do something about that. Ready for take three? We seem to be made to suffer. It's our loss in life. It was mentioned a number of times that C-3PO might sound like a used car salesman, not the English butler type. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I must have fallen over. I just came up with this voice um, of an over-the-top British butler. Um, British because that would be my natural mode of thinking, a butler because that was his, his role in life, nervous because that was his feeling in life, and it came as C-3PO human cyborg relations. And this is my counterpart, R2-D2. Hello. A few people were brought in to record and, and, and attempt was made to see how 3PO would be with different kinds of voices. I believe 30 actors coming in, some really quite impressive names. Stan Freeberg and a few others were auditioned. Apparently one of them was a major uh, cartoon actor, a, a man of literally a thousand voices, who eventually said, you know, something George Tonner's voice is, is pretty good for the character, why didn't you just use his voice? And eventually the discussion just quieted down and it was an excellent performance. It synchronized with his body motions. It was a total character which he created. He was, the, his track was left in the movie. Hey, we don't serve their kind here. What? Your droids, they'll have to wait outside. We don't want them here. Why don't you wait out by the speeder? We don't want any trouble. I heartily agree with you, sir. Four, two, eight, take seven. Action. Here we go, cutting the sublight engines. At long last, the editing, sound, and visual effects were taking shape. But a private screening of the film for Lucas's closest friends didn't do much to bolster his confidence. No! It was an early stage, you know, sort of a, a second or third cut. I had a couple of my friends come up to see it. Brian De Palma was in town, Stephen came, some other friends came to see it. The human characters were there and the sets were there, but of course all the spectacular, you know, you know, the, the Death Star fight and the battle inside the trench and all that was just uh, um, not even there to be seen. So the reaction was not a good one. I loved the movie. I was probably one of the only people in the audience that liked the movie. Some well, of my friends they were very honest. You know, I don't get it. It's kind of, what are you doing here? So that was basically the tenor of the whole thing. Um, and on the other hand, the studio, when Laddie and, and his little group saw the film, they loved it. It's the first time I've actually shown a film, um, and one of the executives even cried at the screening. It was, like, very emotional for him. I sat with my family around the kitchen table in my house, and I said, the most extraordinary day of my life has just taken place. I want you to remember this day, because this is what I never dreamed, but, or maybe I dreamed, but I never thought would, I would have a day as experience like the day I've had today in seeing this film. You know, and I couldn't even believe it, because I'm used to studios. At that point, I was used to studio chiefs saying, you know, this is terrible. You, know, you shouldn't show this to an audience. It's embarrassing, all that kind of stuff. So for me, it was a, you know, a very rewarding thing to show it to people, even though it was in bad shape. It didn't help that one critical element in Star Wars was still missing. There's no lock. The musical score. That ought to hold for a while. Quick, we've got to get across. Find the controls and extend the bridge. Oh, they just blasted it. They're coming through! I remember bugging George, like, when, when can we hear the score? When can we hear the score? <laughs> when can we hear the score? Fortunately, Lucas was able to recruit one of the industry's most accomplished composers. John Williams. Williams had recently won an Oscar for Steven Spielberg's Jaws, and his resume included countless film and television scores, including music for the original Lost in Space television series. I do remember George talking about 
the fact that what we were going to see in the film represents worlds that we hadn't seen, but that the music should give us some kind of an emotional anchor. We heard a, a romantic melody for Princess Leia, or we heard uh, bellicose music for the battle scenes. And some very heavy declamatory thing for Darth Vader. In March 1977, John Williams led the London Symphony Orchestra in the performance of the Star Wars soundtrack. Recorded over 12 days, it was a sweeping symphonic masterpiece, one of the few things to actually exceed Lucas's expectations. To hear Johnny play the music for the first time is a thrill beyond anything I can describe. It was my first opportunity to work with the London Symphony Orchestra, which was a thrill to me. This is Red Five, I'm going in. Like Star Wars itself, the music in the film defied conventional wisdom. At a time when disco was burning up the charts, having a traditional symphonic soundtrack was another huge risk on Lucas's part. He really understood the genre that I was talking about. It's a group of composers that weren't that well looked upon in the 70s. There was a different attitude toward the old fashioned symphonic and the scores. And I had a lot of music in the movie. Somewhere in space, this may all be happening right now. Here they come. Fox said they wanted a trailer out for the Christmas films before the summer release. Coming in too fast! We didn't have any visual effects shots ready then, so we said, well, that's going to be limiting in what the footage can be. It's a big, sprawling space saga of rebellion and romance. What was really cool about the trailer was that uh, we were still working on the movie. It's an epic of heroes. Villains and aliens from a thousand worlds. It was more about the spirit of it. It introduced a lot of different characters, the robots. One thing they did have was a couple of the very early lightsabers. Star Wars, a billion years in the making, and it's coming to your galaxy this summer. It was fun. Industry insiders had been predicting doom for Star Wars, but a small army of fans had been building, thanks to the foresight of Lucasfilm. Charles Lippincott was brought in as a marketing director. He was a science fiction fan. He had contacts with the fan base. That was critical, we felt. The science fiction fans were going to be the, the big supporter of this film, regardless of its popularity with any other audience, so that was the key target audience to start with. Aside from licensing posters and t-shirts, there was little support outside of Lucasfilm's marketing efforts to promote Star Wars. Fortunately, Charles Lippincott was able to secure a comic book deal with Stan Lee and Marvel Comics. He also convinced Del Rey to publish a novelized version of George Lucas's screenplay in November 1976. By February the next year, half a million copies had completely sold out. Fearing Star Wars would get crushed by other summer movies, like Smokey and the Bandit, Fox moved its release to the Wednesday before Memorial Day, but fewer than 40 theaters agreed to show it. Nobody wanted to book it. That same summer of 1977, Fox released a film called The Other Side of Midnight, which was based on an enormously successful bestseller. It wasn't a very good film, but it was a very, very much expected book. And in order to exhibit The Other Side of Midnight, you had to exhibit Star Wars. We sent out a beautiful book, and that didn't seem to make an impact on them at all. We had very few bookings. Also, it wasn't that there had been Time or Newsweek or any of that stuff preceding this hadn't been screened and hadn't gotten the reviews. On the eve of Star Wars release, 20th Century Fox, George Lucas, and the cast and crew braced themselves for the worst. One way or another, May 25th, 1977, would be a day 
they'd never forget. shot was one of the most important shots in the movie for the visual effects because if the audience bought that shot you had them the combined chest of everybody just kind of went <gasps> air was sucked out of the place and then when the white starter sphere came over head I teared up it was so powerful I had seen that scene, but without music, without context, it's not the same thing. We're doomed. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. There was this sort of weird electric kind of reaction. One had never seen anything like it. I'm gonna make the jump to light speed. I had never experienced special effects that were so real. I was, I was, I was dazzled. I'm Luke Skywalker. I'm here to rescue you. This is some rescue. I loved it because I loved the story and I loved the characters. Will somebody get this big walking carpet out of my way. Good luck. I thought that it was revolutionary. This is a work of genius. The Force will be with you, always. No! <laughs> we were in shock. I felt like we were blasted in the back of our seats. I said, man, that was, who worked on this? I'm going in. Use the Force, Luke. I have you now. The theater was jammed full of people right down to the front, and uh, there was a lot of hollering and cheering going on. You're all clear, kid. Now let's blow this thing and go home. After it was over, everyone was like on cloud nine, just kind of in shock. We had no clue what we were on. It was wonderful. <laughs> I remember leaving the theater and having these kids ask us for autographs. They said, no, you don't want our autograph. We're like model builders. No, no, we want you to sign this. So we were thinking, wow, this must mean something. People are asking for our autograph. Everybody's standing up and applauding. I've never seen this before in my life. I mean, and I'll never see it again. We released, I think, 37 theaters initially and broke 36 house records. I was completely shocked. Ugh. It got an amazing response. I used to drive by and look at the lines and think, what? I mean, it was the first sort of blockbuster. George Lucas' Star Wars lifted us out of our sort of depression of the 70s and into an awareness and a focus on space and its possible future. This movie stood by itself. Timing is everything in art. You bring out Star Wars too early and it's Buck Rogers. You bring it out too late and it doesn't fit our imagination. You bring it out just as the war in Vietnam is ending, when America feels uncertain of itself, when the old stories have died. And you bring it out at that time and suddenly it's a new game. Also, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to watch Star Wars. People started seeing the world in the terms that Star Wars had laid down. People would say, may the force be with you. It was a kind of code, almost. It proved that you were one of the, the people who had seen the film, and you were connecting with other people who had seen the film. Star Wars became a, like a kind of handshake. In the wake of Star Wars, 
everyone's careers were changed. Overnight, Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, and Harrison Ford had become household names. I felt like this. Great, terrific, now I can go to work. Now I have an opportunity to take advantage of the success of this film and, and uh, go to work. And as much as life changed for us, it changed for George as well. About a month after it was released, I said, okay, it's a hit. I can now go ahead. I can make my other movies. I'm gonna do this. Ironically, the independent filmmaker who wanted nothing to do with corporate Hollywood was now credited with reinvigorating it. In three weeks, Fox's stock price doubled to a record high. A bunch of the guys I remember at that point ran out and bought a bunch of stock at Fox. I wasn't smart enough. The greatest profit that 20th Century Fox had ever made in a single year was $37 million. And in 19, whatever that year, 77, 78, whatever that year was, they made a profit of $79 million. That was Star Wars. The cultural impact of Lucas's outer space story was greater than anything even he could have imagined, not just in the United States, but around the globe. It wasn't a story of cultures, it wasn't a story of nationalities, it wasn't a story of geography. It was a story of mankind escaping his environment to a life which everybody expects to happen, but uh, George Lucas was able to illustrate for us. This was what made it a success worldwide. The movie did spectacular business across Europe, but when Alan Ladd Jr. attended the premiere in Japan one year later, he feared that the silence which followed the screening indicated that Star Wars would be a flop. He was relieved when he later found out that silence was the greatest compliment a Japanese audience could give a film. We had the footprint ceremony in the Chinese theater. R2-D2, hurry up. Thousands of people showed up. So we were sure by then that there was much more to it than just the science fiction audience. Not surprisingly, Star Wars' greatest fans were children. They thrilled to the fantasy adventures of Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, and Princess Leia and they were eager to bring the experience of the movie home with them. But little Star Wars merchandise was available for the first few months after its premiere. To help promote the movie, Lucasfilm's Charles Lippincott had tried to attract potential licensees before the film opened. But prior to Star Wars, there had been few successful motion picture licensing campaigns, and Lippincott's attempts were flatly rejected. Just one company, Kenner Toys, signed on shortly before Star Wars opened. Kenner didn't believe the film would be a hit, but they were interested in creating a modest line of colorful space toys. When Star Wars became a smash, they were caught completely off guard. Unable to produce toys in time for Christmas orders, Kenner resorted to selling boxed vouchers for Star Wars action figures. There wasn't anything available when the film came out. There wasn't even anything available for the following Christmas of 77. Um, that was the, the infamous empty box campaign where the idea proposed by Kenner was that there'd be these wonderful boxes with all the Star Wars illustrations on them and the kid would get this for Christmas and he'd open it up and there'd be a little certificate in there saying you can get this toy in March. The Star Wars Early Bird Certificate Package, new from Kenner. I lit up when I found out that they were gonna make my face a mask on a box of cereal with little dots where to cut my eyes out. The idea of me being on bubblegum cards, you know, I thought you had to have athletic ability to be a bubblegum card. So I enjoyed the merchandising aspect of it. You know, we signed away our likeness, so when I look in the mirror, I have to pay George a couple of bucks. You're not really famous until you're a Pez dispenser. But, uh, you know, you sort of realize I'm not really famous. Princess Leia is. And I look like her. And I owe George a couple of bucks. For Lucas, protecting the quality and integrity of his vision 
became as important as gaining his financial independence from Hollywood studios. Merchandising offered a means to an end, one that helped fuel support for more Star Wars films, as well as other important projects. In the world of merchandising, oh goodness gracious, people came to us with ideas all the time, every day, day and night, from all over the world for Star Wars merchandise. We were the ones in those days to say, no, sorry, that doesn't fit into our plan. At the 1978 Academy Awards, Star Wars earned an impressive 10 Oscar nominations and took home seven, including statues for best visual effects, sound, editing, and production design. It was terrific, I don't know. It was great, it was like a dream come true. It's the American dream. I wound up winning the Academy Award for Star Wars before I'd even started thinking about winning Academy Awards. My goal was to get another job. While it didn't win for Best Picture, its nomination was quite an achievement for George Lucas and his kids' movie. In addition to industry acclaim, Star Wars earned more money than any movie in history. After years of fighting uphill battles, Lucas could finally call his own shots with the studios. When Fox approached him about doing the inevitable sequel, it was the moment the filmmaker had long been waiting for. This was a perfect opportunity to become independent of the Hollywood system. I didn't mind releasing it through them, but it was really going to them for the money and them saying, well, I like the script, but I want to change, or uh, the film is good, but we want to make these changes. That's the part I wanted to avoid. I decided I was going to finance the film myself, that I was going to make it completely independently. The rule in Hollywood is never put your own money in any film, even your own film. But George was self-financing The Empire Strikes Back, but he was doing it through the bank, and we were talking about close to a $30 million film at the time. Uh, but because of the huge success of the first picture and of the revenues that were still rolling in, and merchandising was very strong. It was a gamble, but a gamble that he knew would pay off. With his earnings from Star Wars, Lucas was able to secure a bank loan for The Empire Strikes Back. Empire's original budget was $25 million, more than twice that of the first film. We would meet at Medway, which was George's uh, uh, San Francisco office, and look at the uh, illustrations while George was writing the script. And Gary Kirst would fly in occasionally from London, and Ralph McQuarrie would send down drawings, conceptual designs, as well as Joe Johnson. The Empire Strikes Back would reunite much of the Star Wars cast. It would also move the story in new directions, digging more deeply into the emotions of the characters. George had been given enormous license by the success of Star Wars. And so when he started talking to me about the Empire script that didn't exist, he knew what had happened in the story, and it was very dark stuff. I was delighted that it was not going to be a rehash of Star Wars. But in fact, after having set the whole thing up and gotten a rousing start, you launch into the second act in which everything goes to hell. And that's usually the best act in a play. Empire would also open the door to a romance between Han Solo and Princess Leia. But this time, George Lucas wasn't getting in the director's chair. It was just too hard to set up a company, get the money, get the film made, and also be down there on the set every day trying to direct it. Um, so I decided I'd hire a director. I was asked by George to come to lunch at Universal. And he said, uh, how would you like to do the second Star Wars? We had no title for it at that point. And I said, gee, George, I don't think so. It's a phenomenal hit as a picture. A second one can only be a second one. It can't be as good because the first one is the breakthrough. And I told my agent about the meeting, and he said, are you crazy? Do it! There were approximately 64 sets on this picture, which is much bigger than Star Wars. 
George, that the film has to be much better and much bigger and much more complex than Star Wars because if the second one doesn't work, it's the end of Star Wars. If it does work, then I can continue making more of them. I said, it doesn't put me in a very comfortable position. It's a hell of a responsibility. Known for smaller, character-driven films like Up the Sandbox and The Eyes of Laura Mars, Irvin